now for something special. The unit is self-contained with its own saddler, farrier, wheelwright and so on. It's a rigorous training dished on who know all there is to know about horses and it brings results. We take you behind the scenes now to show just some of the interesting aspects of this training. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein, the number one podcast to create sound of horses from the ground up. Mike Stein is a registered journeyman farrier with an APF1 accreditation. On this week's show, we have a professor, Travis Burns, from Virginia Tech's Large Animal Clinic. We'll be talking to him all throughout the show today, so make sure you stick around and make sure you sign up for YouTube channel over there. Make sure you subscribe to Mike Stein over there on YouTube, and you can see these videos in real time as we're talking about them here on the air. And over to my far inside is Mike Stein. How are you? I'm doing good, Travis. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. So, as you know, oh, yes. I, thought I, I thought I heard music in the background. As you know, my wife took Diego. Right. Oh, God. Here we go. Diego. <laughs> the right. bane of my existence. So You'll never retire. I, ne I will never retire with this horse. You know, we as we have, uh, you know, three horses here, two on the property, one off property being, you know, caught and, and, and cradled and everything. So... My wife did the four-day clinic last week. Right. She said that she was out there every day for three, three and a half hours on the horse, under the horse, around the horse, doing these big clinics. And Diego was like, oh, mom, I'm getting tired. I'm getting tired. So after the clinic was done and she came home, I said, you know, how did everything go? And she said everything went well. Right. And then the next day she said, well, let me go out and check on Diego because he, he was kind of like not limping getting out of the trailer, just kind of slow getting out of the trailer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and put her in the stall or put him in the stall so she goes out the next day and she notices one of his hind quarters has gotten has swollen a little bit i've not heard this one yet and so i said i said well what happened did he bump his leg on the trailer did you know did something happen did another horse kick him because he essentially went from the training grounds to the trailer back to his stall at where he's staying over at day, day camp day camp yes um she's like no but I, I I wanna say, and this is my wife talking, she goes, you know, we didn't really turn them out like during the day. You know, right. they were out there for three hours and then they'd go back in their stall with the little paddocks and everything. She said maybe because he was kind of stall resting the whole entire time, whatever muscle group, and I'm just I'm just you know me, Mike, I don't know anything about horses, that his leg wasn't getting the, the maneuverability after working out for so long that's one thing she said what? yeah the second thing she said the 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 ground the track or whatever that they were in the um arena was a really really soft sand clay loom mix right and so diego's not used to we have the crush run on our uh you know on our arena that we right. have here he would sink in you know a good four to five inches Mm, and he's used to sitting on top more. Exactly. So she was saying that the combination of, of him not being turned out every day after practice, <laughs> listen to me, my baseball, basketball terms, after practice, you know, practice, Di yes. Diego was not turned out to, to stretch and, you know, get all the, the lubes and everything going, form this swelling in this, in this back hind quarter. So have you heard of that before as far as, you know, not getting, not being turned out? I, I would think that after a, a nice hard workout, especially if I did a night, if I did a nice hard workout. We can tell you do nice hard workouts <laughs> on a daily basis. I would want to just sit in my, my fat, comfy lounge chair and not do anything. But my leg's not going to swell up from doing that. No, and no telling what he did when he got out with, with back home with his new friends either. Well, he went, like I said, straight from the stall. In, or straight from the trailer into a stall. And he overnighted in the stall. And he overnighted in the stall. And then, you know, the next morning, then they started doing the, because they came back, I think, some weird, like four o'clock in the afternoon, which he would have been in a stall anyways right. during that time of the day. He already missed his turning out part, which would have been the morning time. So they just said, okay, the next day we'll start him back up as far as turning. You know, he does his training in the morning. Then he gets turned out for a couple hours. And then, at, you know, 4 o'clock, they feed him around 4 o'clock, 4.30, which is real early for us. Right. Uh, and then then he gets, you know, in the stall. So would that cause the back leg to swell? You or know, if, if he had strained something a little bit when he was there and then not moving, yes, the leg probably could puff up some. I've not seen exactly what, when, or where. But she she actually said she blamed 
the not turning him out after working out. And I would, like I said, I would think that you would want to stay in the in the the nice comfy chair until you got better. But I guess not with a horse. I, I don't know. Not necessarily. And that that softy loom. You know, I can I can only imagine because I was born and raised in Florida. Mm-hmm. I I know first of all I you hate run into soft sand. <laughs> I hate the beach. God, I hate the beach. Believe right. it or not, uh, I'll bleed sand all day long, but I just cannot stand the beach. I, it's just sticky and nasty for me. I I just don't enjoy it at all. I know. Listen to me. It ruins your makeup. <laughs> it does. It ruins my hair, my skin, yeah. everything. And uh, but I know I've run like as a kid. Oh, we're at the beach. You're all excited, and you come up over the sand dune after you parked your car, and you're running down the the sand dune into the, and you're running through that <laughs> that soft sand until you can get closer to the water. And the closer to the water, the hard sand, the the tougher the sand gets to. Right. So I just thought he might have pulled something. Possible. And you were out there the other day. Have you shooed him or done any or trimmings or anything on him since he's I've, been back? I've worked on I worked on those guys over there before they went. Uh huh. Like the week before they went, I think was their time and schedule. So nothing. You haven't been over there since. No. Okay. <laughs> You're on a four week five. Was it five weeks over there? I was a couple of weeks early because I I did have to make a back over, but not for your horse. Okay, not for mine. Yeah, Diego <laughs> on the wayside. All right, guys, stick around. We got a lot to talk about. And we have a special guest here in the studio, Professor uh, Travis Burns from Virginia Tech's Large Animal Clinic. We'll talk to him when we come back. So stick around. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. Beep. There he is. <laughs> Man, that's a lot of energy for a Monday morning. <laughs> I don't know if I can match that. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, Travis is just a lot of energy. Yeah, I, yeah. I, it's just the nature of. I, the, the thing is, when Mike came to me to do, we've been doing this podcast for about two years now, coming up on on our anniversary here. Mike goes, I want to do a horse podcast. And I go, okay, I've been doing podcasts since, or doing radio form at some point since 99. And uh, I listened to like horse podcasts. And, and and all these and it's kind of like, so, when did you when did you uh, first discovered you liked horses? Well, as a child, Margaret, I uh, loved horses. <laughs> I'm like, going, no, come on, don't. I'm like, Mike, come on, man, we we got to yeah. step this game up. So, for sure. All right, we're gonna bring you in and uh, uh, start the show. Okay, Mike, you ready? I'm ready. Trav, you ready? I'm just hanging out. Sure. Can I call you Trav? Everyone calls me Trav. Yeah, okay. that's no problem. All right, just checking. He's so, been called other things. <laughs> I bet for sure. All right, make sure we're all up and rolling. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Sign. If you have a question for Mike Sign, the way you get those questions in is to go to equinedynamics.com. At the top of the page says, contact us. Uh, you can ask us a question anytime on, based on any episode that you've heard here over the last two years. Mike, we're coming up on the end of the season. Yes, we are. Season. Uh, this is season seven, uh, and we got a whole brand new season starting at the first of the year, so we got one more show left. So now's your chance during this Christmas break, this Christmas holiday. we got one more show left on this season season seven for you to go back and get caught up on everything and listen to all the fine guests that we've had here on equine dynamics with mike stein and over to my far inside is mike stein how are you i'm doing good this morning travis how are you i'm doing all how right are you, travis <laughs> and joining us another travis popular name this time of the morning is professor travis burns from virginia tech's large animal clinic how are you thanks for joining us today Oh, I'm doing great. I really appreciate the opportunity to join you guys. So you're a young guy, and you know you, when you think professor, you when you think you know college teachers and stuff, you think of the the guy with the um what's the with the elbow pads on their knees, the not the elbow oh, pads, yes. but the little you know he's got the the yeah. corduroy jacket on, and you just you know, think of shoulders. Yeah, exactly. So you're a young gentleman. How long have you been doing this, and how did you get started, and and why Virginia Tech? Huh. Yeah, so I, I've been shoeing horses for over over 20 years. I started out fair, fairly young, um, so I count all all 20 of those years as as professional. But I was shoeing horses uh, much younger younger than that. But I don't know that I was doing a lot of good. I grew up and uh, my family ran a trail guide service in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park at Smokemont, and so my dad and two uncles would would shoe those horses um, there. And so I got 
kind of started when I was a when I was a kid. I just got interested in in that. I was a bit of a, a wild child as a as a kid, so they didn't always allow me to be around while they were shooting the horses. Which <laughs> get the I hammer away understand. from him. Get the hammer away from him. What yeah, is he exactly. doing with it? <laughs> so, so I completely understand now. But uh, um, but I just became kind of interested, kind of uh, obsessed with it, really. And then when I went off to college, um, I started out at the University of Tennessee. <laughs> And that was really my first experience with seeing a, a therapeutic type farrier. There was a farrier there at the vet school who I, I didn't actually know his name at the time, but his name is Dudley Hurst. And they were doing, they were making heart bars for a horse that had laminitis. And, and to me, I'd never seen someone make a shoe, weld a shoe, grind a shoe, do, do all of that kind of thing. And um, this would have been in 2002. And so I, I, to 18 year old me, that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And so from there, that's when I went to fair school, started working with some fairs in North Carolina, then eventually moved to Virginia to work with another therapeutic farrier there. And that's kind of how I wound up at Virginia Tech. So I left North Carolina to go work for a guy named Paul Goodness and his group fair practice in Northern Virginia called Forging Ahead. And ironically, he was and his group were the resident fairs for the Marion DuPont Scott Equine Medical Center in Leesburg, Virginia. And that is a satellite hospital to the, the vet school that I work for now. So when they decided to hire a farrier back in 2009, um, I, I was approached, you know, became aware of the job, applied, went through the interview process and was lucky enough to be selected. So next month will be 14 years here. Oh, wow. Wow. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Now, now explain. I, I asked you before we started the show. I said, you know, you're you're with the large animal clinic at Virginia Tech. And then you said, well, kind of, sort of, we're Virginia Tech is partnered with, you know, company A. C explain that partnership that you have. Yeah. So so technically I work for the Virginia, Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. And so the, the vet school here at Virginia Tech, it's the main campus with all the students, the veterinary teaching hospital that is based here on Virginia Tech's campus in Blacksburg. Like right now, right outside my office, I can see the baseball field, football field, all that. So we're, we're right on the heart of, of campus here in Blacksburg. Um, but it's actually a joint effort between Virginia Tech and the University of Maryland. So we have several campuses. So we have faculty members and graduate students at the University of Maryland in College Park. Um, I alluded to it earlier, we have the equine satellite hospital in Leesburg, Virginia. Then we have um, uh, the ACCRC, which is a, a cancer and care and research facility in Roanoke, Virginia. So it's a it's a campus and college that's made up of multiple different different locations. And I just happen to be the one, the farrier here in Blacksburg on Virginia Tech's campus. So often, you know, I get associated with just being at Virginia Tech, but it's a joint effort. Uh, now, so you are, are you one of many professors that are out there or are you the main guy that, you know, hey, if you're going to go to, you know, the equine uh, farrier type um, section of the school, are you the main guy or do you have several different professors around you? Oh, there's a lot, there's a lot of professors here. And so we're in a, the, i and I am in the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences, and that's a joint group between all the equine faculty members and then the food animal faculty members. So we have surgeons, internal medicine, and field service, and equine sports medicine faculty members as well in our section. I just happen to be the only farrier that's a faculty member here. And then we also have another farrier that works with us in our service. She's a staff member uh, named Gabby Evans. Now, I, I, not to dive deep into your personal business, but, sure. you know, I, we had other people that have been, you know, doctors of veterinary medicine. We've had nutritionists on here and all of them at one point, two things you guys have in common um, mm -hmm. is they all started as, you know, a kid on either their, their dad's farm or grandmother's or grandfather's farm, shoeing horses and just got interested in that aspect, which is, is unbelievable for, for me because I'm a, like I said I, uh, earlier, I was uh, born and raised in Orlando, Florida. So I'm Mickey Mouse land, you know, when everyone sure. sees you're yeah, Mickey Mouse. I am, oh boy. And then from there, they said they started as farriers and, you know, got into the business and stuff and then went to college to learn about farrying. Ferrying is that is that the word that you would use? <laughs> Shoeing horses, let's put it that way. And then and then they got another interest, whether it be they they branch off and go into medicine or they branch off and go in nutrition, but they still had that farrier background. What made you stay with it and and not break off into another aspect of of the biomechanics of a horse? Uh, for for me, so 
being a fair is all I've ever wanted to be. Um, but again, I won't bore you too much with my personal story, but I grew up with mostly a single mom. She's really the, the one who raised me and she was a high school dropout. Um, and was, uh, obviously the very first years once I came along were pretty, pretty rough and stressful for her. And so when I went to kindergarten, it's amazing. She went back, got her GED, then went on to a community college, got an associate's degree, then went on, got her bachelor's degree all in business administration. So wow. I watched my mom work from, you know, pretty poor, a poverty level, all the way to being the general manager of a, of a country club. And so I've got an extreme work ethic from her and an extreme appreciation for education. So I'll admit at 18, I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to go to college. I knew that I wanted to shoot horses and you don't have to have a college degree to, to do that, obviously. But in my family, to her, there was there was no option. I was going to college and I was lucky enough to go on a, on a full scholarship um, and got to, to delve into animal sciences, which related to, to fairy very well. And, and obviously I was able to find farriers to, to work with and keep that interest. And I did toy with the idea of wanting to go to, to vet school um, at one time, but I, I figured out very quickly that it's really just the horses that I like and very specifically just their feet. But being in a university and being around those other colleges of veterinary medicine, so at the University of Tennessee and at uh, North Carolina State University, that's where I got to, to learn about other faculty members there and their research interests and, and positions within colleges of veterinary medicine. And I figured out very early that those were my people. Like I, I can be a very nerdy individual. I really want to know why for everything. I don't always have the great personal skills. Like I, you know, I, I value knowledge over relationships often, oftentimes, which can be, can be difficult. And so, um, being around individuals like that, that are super focused on their area of interest suited me very well because I was super focused almost to an obsessive level on farrier or the horse's foot at the time. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick little break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the, his students, Travis Burns, students, how focused they are in his class and, and get a little in depth, in depth, uh, interview on that as yeah. well. All right, see guys. See how they're doing. Yeah. See how they're doing. Stick around. You're listening to equine dynamics with Mike sign. He'll be right back. Jobs. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, see right on time. The book, the booking agent. I got to. Yeah. <laughs> I actually learned about airplane mode on the phone not too long ago. <laughs> Mike would come up here and he's like, uh, Mike would phone would go off all the time. I'm like, Mike, he goes, I got to turn all it right. off. I'm like, Mike, just put it on airplane mode. He's like, what's airplane oh. mode? <laughs> that guy over there. I, I'm real techie. <laughs> no. You know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and we've got, you know, million dollar horses we're trusting in, you know, Mike putting shoes on them. <laughs> That's for sure. Right, give me one second. We'll move Mike over here. <laughs> You're moving my camera now. I know, I got to move your camera around. You're going to put me off camera? I'm put you right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yep. Trav, you ready? Sure. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. Don't forget, for every podcast we do, we have a matching video, and you can see us in real time as we're talking here in the studio. Just go over to YouTube, search Equine Dynamics, or... Equine Dynamics with Mike Sign. That's what I meant to say. That's it. Yeah. And you can see all the different videos, the full-length podcast videos. There are also a whole bunch of little what they call shorts up there. And I think you you dubbed them snippets. Snippets. So if you yeah. don't have time to sit there and watch the whole entire podcast, you can get all the little keynotes and stuff over on YouTube as well. And you can just watch those in real time. Make sure you like and share them to all your friends and stuff. And over to my far hand side is Mike Stein. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you and how are you, Travis? I'm, Travis I'm, and I'm, Travis. I'm well. And joining us also in the studio, Professor Travis Burns from Virginia Tech's Large Animal Clinic. How are you, Travis? Oh, I'm doing great. Now, um, you were talking about, you know, you're more committed to knowledge over like building like relationships and stuff. And I, and, and I can understand that as well, because, you know, if I, I don't want to be the guy in the room that doesn't know what's going on, if, if I can't, if I don't know what's going on, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask that person, Hey, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? That type deal. Now it takes a certain breed of person to actually say, I'm going to be a farrier. As we all know, we, uh, first of all, I've said this a million times, horse people in general are weird. You know, my, Very much so. my, my, my wife, Myself included. Yeah, exactly. And I got Mike over here. I'm the one I'm the, I'm the, the normal one, the simpleton. The one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea about horses. Only what I learned from my wife as far as osmosis and everything. Uh, but I do learn a lot and I've learned a lot here 
uh, listening to Mike and talking to Mike over the last two years, and I hope everyone out there, our listeners, have learned as well. Uh, I know a lot of people have come up to me um, off air and, and said, you know, I really do appreciate what you guys do here on the show. So, and we appreciate you, uh, Travis Burns, for being on the show with us. So, you're you're a professor now. You have a class. I'm assuming a class. Now, when I was in college, my class was those big, uh, you know, auditorium where there was like 200 kids and there was a, a teacher down at the bottom and he had like a, back in my day, we didn't back have, day. we didn't have the big, you know, fancy screens and stuff. We had the overhead where he would write on the clear thing on the thing and would project it onto the screen up top. It was you know, simple times well, back then. Yeah, but <laughs> they, that, that was a step up from taking a stick and scratching it in the dirt. Well, right? I was going to say, you know, they had chalk, they had chalkboards, and one professor that I had actually had a on a stick. It was a long stick, so right. he'd write on the board so everyone in the back could see it. Now, uh, Travis, tell us about the students that you're seeing. How I know they're they're a certain age, but what are what are you seeing with the students that you have coming in? What's your class size, and what's an everyday? um schedule for someone who's in your class sure so so we we do a couple things a little differently here and so it is uh, a graduate school a professional school so the the vet students here are probably what you think of as my more traditional students and so we actually just wrapped it up last week but in their third year i teach a three credit course all on equine podiatry or, or fairy and in it you know there's probably 25 26 hours of lecture and then about 40, 44 hours of lab hands-on time for them. So they get a lot of lectures on anatomy and physiology of the foot, distal limb, the biomechanics of the, the hoof capsule, the various disease pathologies that affect the hoof and the, the distal limb. And then in lab, they will actually trim and chew some cadaver limbs. They'll uh, go through shaping, fitting a shoe. They'll radiograph their, their feet. They'll do joint injections. Um, they'll glue on shoes. They will um, do crack repair. They'll do hoof wall resections for the treatment of keratoma, white line disease, stuff, stuff like that. So kind of all hands-on learning. And um, that's during their third year, during their fall semester. And then their fourth year, they also have the option to spend a three-week rotation with the farrier service in the veterinary teaching hospital. And during that three-week period, obviously we'll round, which is kind of like giving lectures, small group-based discussions, things like that. And then they'll be a part of the entire clinical day with us, trimming and chewing horses or seeing cases that are presented to the to the teaching hospital here now how large are how large are your classes are you talking like you know like i said i have an auditorium about 200 and some odd students do you have that size class or is it more of a one-on-one -on -one basis where you might have 10 to 15 students that you can actually be a little bit more you know un uh, informal with them or whatever you want to address yeah. that so, so that one class, the the podiatry class, is it's capped at sixteen okay. um, students, and then I, but I also do lectures. So each class size here, you know, the class of twenty twenty three, the class of twenty twenty four, all of those, they're about one hundred and twenty five students in each class, and so during some of the lectures, you know, I lecture throughout the the preclinical year curriculum as well, and sometimes I'll go into a classroom with all one hundred and twenty six students, sometimes seventy students sometimes 50 students, and then the smallest, once you get into that third year, the really focusing elective tracks, the classes get much, much smaller. So it's just equine, uh, horse-focused people at that that point. Now, do you, so now, that's why it gets smaller. Now, one thing that I know, I, I've dropped a lot of classes in my, <laughs> my school days. Those Saturday classes at 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm not getting up for those, you know. Um, sure. Are you still, when you get down to the 16, you know, students in their third year, are you seeing – you know, a, a pass rate of a high percentage, like, you know, 95, 80 or 90, 98 or whatever. Are you seeing high percentages of pass rates or do you see the class is too hard or, or I'm just, I'm not, I'm losing interest in them, but I guess after the third year, they pretty much just weeded themselves out or as far as they've taken a different path, they're not going on the path that those 16 or, or so are, are, are going for. Sure, sure. No. So there's a, a very high pass pass rate, to be honest with you. I think in the 12 years I've been teaching that course, I don't think we've had anyone fail or drop out of, of that particular course. Once they, they've they committed to going to, to vet school um, and then they get through the interview process and get here, they're generally extremely exceptional students that are very intelligent. They're usually extremely highly motivated. You know, we'll have some that will change like their, their interests, like they might come in as small animal and go the equine route 
out or they might come in thinking they want to do equine medicine but then go small animal but it's very very rare that we have somebody change their mind and totally drop out or move move um, out of the profession they really? change roles within the discipline but uh, but they're they're pretty committed by the time well, good. they get here go, go ahead mike yeah, i'm really glad to see that the vet schools have really stepped up the game a lot of them have as far as the, podiat the podiatry deal because i think at one time it was like a a day in the cow barn right you know yeah no so it, it used to be something that's not very well covered within the curriculum but but it seems that the majority of the the vet schools are are taking an interest in at least forming some relationship with a farrier and allow them to do some teaching things and some go as far as to hire an employee farriers as faculty members and you know kind of immerse them in all all aspects of the college so here's a question that i have so mike went to you went to a, a farrier tech school i did you did okay but you were basically you could walk in off the street sign up right pay your fee they taught you what you know whatever their their curriculum was right and then you walked away with your piece of paper and everything says, says mike is a farrier that's that's what it that's says it, yeah now uh professor barnes can i can i do that in your class or i physically have to qualify that and what what difference what are what's the curriculum difference between your class that you give as to the tech school or the you know i, I well you know, Go ahead, Mike. It, it, fill it, fill it, in the blanks for me. It's a lot of difference. And uh, there's there's still people that have never been to a ferry school that become some phen phenomenal farriers. And my first taste of it and start around it was uh, actually kind of close to where Travis started, I think, with yeah. some of the same people. I and, believe so. And uh, I think what got started is he got his leg broken by a horse. And there was some old broodmare standing there. <laughs> oh. Is that true, Professor? You you had your leg broken? No, 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 no. Oh, I'm sorry. The person, no, 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 the person no, no, no. who first the put teacher me, at the same school. Oh, the okay, first sorry. person that ever put me under horse. I was farm help. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, so I can I cannot walk in off the street and sign up for your class. Is that what basically you're telling me that I can't do with you? Um, for for me and ours, and and yes, yes. so we're we're not. Well, so that's where it gets complicated. We do train farriers here. So I've probably had, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there, farriers that have come to work here with us for at least a year and and go on and become, you know, I, I think very well, uh, very accomplished farriers. But the course we're referencing is just for veterinary students in the doctor of veterinary medicine curriculum here. And so you have to meet the prerequisite requirements to get into vet school, be a part of the, the vet school, and then you matriculate through the years and be able to, to attend this course. Um, but they're going to go on and be typically vets, not vet farriers. We've we've had one leave here that left and went on to become a vet farrier and go to work at Rudin Riddle and eventually moved to, to Aiken, South Carolina. But but it tends to be students that are going to become equine veterinarians, and this is just a portion of their educational experience. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick little break, and when we come back, we're going to ask Professor Travis Barnes. It's uh, I'm sorry. Burns. Burns, Burns. sorry. Mr. Prof Burns. I know. <laughs> Professor Travis Burns about some of the most common issues that you would see with horses in vet school. So stick around. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. I've got a little toddler at home, and I, I think I've been coughing for four years. Oh, no. <laughs> well, congratulations on the toddler. Oh, thank you. And I apologize for that. Sometimes my brain talks faster than my mouth does. Oh, that's all right. I completely understand. Yeah. My brain goes 100 miles an hour, and I have to try to rein it back in because I can't talk that fast. <laughs> Yeah, well, I just think stuff that comes out my mouth sometimes. No. People say there's supposed to be a filter. There's not. <laughs> Some of the stuff you say, Mike, I'm like, oh, yeah. get back in the when we're done with the show. Edit, edit that out. I don't. <laughs> we don't need the jokes about that. You know, oh, whatever. Wow. <laughs> That's all right. He he uh, he means well. All right. So when we That's come back, sure. we're gonna talk about the most common issues that you see with uh, horses in vet school and are there any memorable cases that you would like to share with us kind of like a case study type deal sure okay mike you ready yes sir travis you ready sure welcome back to equine dynamics with mike stein don't forget if you've got a question for mike stein now's your chance to go over to equine dynamics.com at top of the page says contact us fill out that little form make sure you put a return address we're getting close to the end of the year and uh if you uh 
send us an email with a question. We read it on the air. We'll send you out a little prize pack for all the little uh, kitties out there so you can put them in your stocking stuffers and have something underneath the Christmas tree for them from Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. Oh, yeah. And over yeah, to my far end. Nobody will be able to get through Christmas without it. <laughs> no, they all need them. And over to my far end side is Mike Stein. How are you? I'm doing good. And joining us here in the studio, we have Professor Travis Burns from Virginia Tech Large Animal Clinic. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm going to switch this right here so we can all be friends. <clears throat> now, through your 12, 12 plus years as a professor, what are the most common issues that you're seeing with horses at vet school? Um, so I'd say the most common cases we get here are um, probably horses suffering from white line disease. So, you know, a disease pathology that creates a separation within the hoof capsule. Um, so we see a lot of that. We see a lot of cracks. So whether they're toe cracks, quarter cracks, you kind of think about fracturing the horse's hoof capsule, um, kind of like you would a bone. So we, we see a lot of those. And then the next most common one we probably see would be a lot of horses suffering from laminitis. So a disease pathology where the attachment between the hoof capsule and the bony column becomes compromised and the bone can become unstable within the hoof capsule. Now you say that those you, are, oh, go ahead. I, mean, I was just going to say those are probably the three most common things we see here or get referred to us. Now, you say that these are the most common things that you see with horses. Now, you were saying that, you know, you got a little toddler and you, you got a little cold going on and we know what to do when we have a common cold. You take vitamin C, you, you know, zinc and all the other stuff that's over the, over the counter type medicine. If these are the most common things that you're seeing in horses, why aren't we as horse owners and horse trainers and, and, you know, down the list, how come we're not doing more to prevent these things? Because these things, not like a, a general cold that we get as a human, they're not going to knock, not knock us out, but they're not going to end our lives. These common items, these common things that you're seeing could end a horse's life. How come we're not doing something or what can we do to make sure that these are not the most common things and something simple as, you know, something else will go on to something else. Sure. No, I, I think a lot of things are, are being done and, and for preventative health care. Um, and, and I think a lot of things are be, being done through, obviously, vet education, fair education, and really horse owner or client educational events. So most vet practices that I know of, they offer a lot of continuing educational opportunities, outreach efforts for the horse owning public. They try to uh, manage. They the horses from a preventative health care standpoint, so to wellness visits, looking at them when they're well, healthy, you know, shots, vaccines, you know, the basic preventative health care plan, as well as fairs, you know, what we do with trimming and shoeing them is part of a preventative health care plan. So we're trying to limit a lot of these disease pathologies that you see or soundness issues that you see. Um, but unfortunately, that that doesn't always do the trick. Um, I do think, like, for laminitis, that's probably the disease path. Nope. You froze. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Go ahead and pick up where... Uh Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, so So laminitis is probably the disease pathology out of those that would lead to the most uh, deaths for, for the horse from a from a farrier and a vet farrier standpoint. And so a lot of things have been done to try to reduce the incidence of laminitis. And, and they, I do believe that over my 20 years, the incidence rate of laminitis has been reduced. There has been quite a few studies out there at the incidence rate in the UK and the US of laminitis. And that number is is lowering, but it is still still happening. And unfortunately, there's still a lot about that disease process that we don't know or fully understand. And so even though those may be the most common things that I see here, you have to consider that I work in a very large referral practice that has a lot of referring vets and, and farriers that send cases here from probably three, four hours away. So a very large radius. So even though that's the most common thing I see here, it's probably not a fair snapshot of what is happening in the outside. Now I, I understand you I know you're not a doctor but you you're, I know you're not a doctor but you're in that whole the field with everyone else in the, in the same room so it's kind of like having an all-star team uh, to support you. We have an English bulldog and our English bulldog gets the yeasty feet in its pads and there's a medicine that we can physically you know hear open up your mouth, throw the pill down the dog's throat, and that yeasty stuff will go away. Now, of course, you know, there's some other little, like, witch hazel and stuff that we can do on the feet. But is why isn't there something you're seeing, all these common things, these these ailments that horses, is there something that we can give a horse? Now, my wife has been doing, just the other day, she was telling um, that we're putting turpentine right. on Dominique's feet 
to, to harden just them to up. Toughen them up, yeah. Is there is there a pill? Are we getting to that point, or is like the pills too much? It, it's too small for the large size animal. You physically have to go in there and put hands on hooks to uh, to to address these issues. I I think so. The the reason to be here and and really the reason to work as a as a vet fair team is exactly what you said. There are medical and systemic treatment options that the vet side of the profession does administer. So medications, uh, treatment things, things like that. However, when it comes to the horse's body and really the horse's foot, there's a big mechanical component as part of the treatment plan as well. And that's what's often carried out by, by the farrier as part of a vet farrier team. So we typically, or at least I tend to think of myself as just a part or an ancillary part of the team or the treatment plan to aid to it, but the vet side of it is going to do or address hopefully a lot of systemic factors and be able to treat the the whole horse where we mostly just mechanically treat the bottom of the foot. Now, do you physically have horses there on staff? I know you were talking about cadaver legs and, and working on them. Do you physically have a, a barn with stalls and horses that are are they donated? How does how does that process work as far as you working on, on an actual live horse? Yeah, so the live horses we see here, so we see probably fourteen to fifteen hundred cases wow. a year here to the farrier service. Um, the hospital as a whole sees quite a bit more, um, but we have a teaching hospital here, a full uh, surgical facility. We have a fairly large. Uh, five truck ambulatory practice that goes out and sees live horses within a 35 mile radius uh, to the vet school. Um, I really see all my cases here um, at the hospital. So they're either cases that come in just to the farrier service so they can be referred by an outside vet or farrier, or it can be a case that was already here or being presented to the veterinary teaching hospital and just needs that little extra helper or allows us to be a part of it. And then Virginia Tech alone owns about 100 horses. And those horses are typically donated or leased. So we have a riding program here with about 30 horses that the students compete. They learn how to ride. They compete on. They show them. They compete around with other universities. We have a small breeding operation. So we have a bunch of a fair number of broodmares and babies. So foals, yearlings, two-year-olds that are here in their kind of they're, they're raised here, they're trained here, and then they're, they're sold. So another learning opportunity for the students. And then the vet school owns about 30 horses that are used for, for various teaching labs and uh, teaching efforts here by the, by the vet school. So yeah. we take care of those horses as well. You have to have at least 200 and some odd acres to house all these horses and have them just running around. And a, and a, a, lot of land. And a staff of at least at least a thousand people, you, you know, just, just cleaning stalls and feeding and turning them out so they don't get the swollen leg like Diego right. did the other day. There, there's got to, I mean, how large of a staff, just like your, your everyday normal labor staff, do you have any idea of how many, what that count is? I, I don't. There's a lot of them. Um, and so what Virginia Tech does here is there's a lot of faculty members that are a part of, of all of that from the management and leadership of it to also some of the day-to-day -day management and their staff members that participate in that. And then one of the unique things that they have here is one of the equine managers here, Natalie Sloan, um, she developed a volunteer program. So we have a lot of opportunities for students that aren't necessarily horse interested or whatever, but want to, to get some horse experience, they come and they volunteer to help with treatment of the horses, uh, cleaning the stalls, taking them in and out, doing all of those things. And, and I think it's been quite remarkable. Like it's not just, you know, young undergrad students that want to go to vet schools. Like we'll, I'll go over there and I'll encounter uh, a long-term faculty member in the college of business or the uh, in marketing or, or something like that. Like we see a lot of people that just want to spend time and, and do some, some time or activity with horses. And that program, I bet alone is over a hundred individuals. Wow. So there's a lot of, a lot of manpower and a lot of physical space that goes into managing horses like that. And then obviously Virginia Tech being the big land grant university for Virginia, not only do we have all those horses, but we have a lot of cattle. We have a, a dairy, we have sheep, we have pigs, we have goats. <laughs> We've got a lot of animals. You here, got chickens? Here on campus. We do have a big poultry center Do you well. really? <laughs> yeah. So we've got a lot, wow. of, a lot of things here. Uh, so Mike, I have a question. Yes. Um, when we had Dominique 
Dominique. And yes. we had that problem with with her what we consider was kissing spine, but it wasn't kissing spine, well, it was right? Kiss spine, no. It's so her neck. what do we do? We ended up taking her all the way down to Tryon. Is that right? Didn't we trailer her down the? Where did we? Where did you trailer her? I think down to Tryon to to have her X-rayed and, yes, and all that stuff. I it, think so. Yes. Now, how come we didn't take him or take her to Travis Burns here at Virginia Tech? Why? Why would I take him now? Uh, Professor Burns, are you familiar with the Tryon Clinic that I'm talking about? Not ex- not extremely familiar with them, but I you've heard of them heard though. Of, I've heard she of them. Could, yeah, she could have gone into Virginia them. Tech. She could have gone yeah. other places. Yes. Now, could I have taken my horse that had this that had this spinal problem? Could I have taken it to Virginia Tech and and had you guys look at her and kind of diagnose her and stuff? I know because I don't know what the bill would have been going to you guys. I just know I saw the bill going down the Tryon. That was the only thing, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, obviously horses are, are expensive just across the board, but, um, but yes, we have all the same type of personnel, same type of diagnostic imaging opportunities here. It often comes down to like, where do you go is what's closest to you Mm. and really like the team that you have at home. So your vet, your farrier, who they have the great and very good working relationships with. So, you know, I just casually said referring veterinarians early, but it's not a casual thing. Those are really the people that help us see cases or get cases here. So we build relationships with those people. And then, you know, then they're usually pretty loyal. And so when they need extra imaging or a second opinion, things like that, then they tend to get funneled here to Virginia Tech. But if you're vet and farrier or have a better or more close working relationship with Tryon, then that's where they go and you know kind of Mike's area there a lot of those those clientele will and and referring vets and fairs will have a good working relationship with North Carolina State's University Veterinary Teaching Hospital and they will refer them to there you go to Western North Carolina and they often will will go just across the mountain into the University of Tennessee so these large referral centers were all kind of spaced out and it really generally comes down I think you get great care at all of them but it usually comes down to the proximity and professional relationships i'm going i'm going to travis next time i am well, sorry I should, I should. he sold me yeah. he sold me yeah. with with yeah. all the with his, the staff and everything he's got going now granny he's oh, right. got a good deal going up there there's no doubt about it <laughs> two for one sure. or something like that <laughs> no no i no. would love for you guys to come visit and check it out well we, we will we will take uh, take you up on that opportunity all right guys stick around when we come back uh we're gonna dive into some of the uh Travis Burns' most memorable cases that he had to deal with. So stick around. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. Okay. Travis, you having a good time, I hope? Oh, I'm having a great time. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, it, it's kind of funny. I wish I wish I did have your energy because I just did a. This sounds really nerdy, but I just did an online interview with Wheel of Fortune. Oh yeah. So I applied to, to be on there. I don't know several several months ago, and they sent me an email like an online audition. And man, if I if I could just have that energy, I bet they would have picked me. I was kind of <laughs> shell shocked. They just put you on there for like a five minute interview with like ten other people, and they're like, just go. Go, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, and I was like, oh gosh, what do I do? I look like a deer in the headlights, so probably not getting picked. Nah, uh, they they might see something inside of you. You, know? you never, you never know. You never know what they're looking for. Yep. So, how did you meet Mike? Mike's your farrier for your wife. Sources. We, we had we had a farrier when we first moved here. Uh, to North Carolina. We moved here about, uh, I think, 11 years ago. I don't know. I'm not good with dates. (laughs) And uh, we had a farrier that was just basically just shoeing. And uh, Dominique, who was our our mare, my wife rides dressage, and she just wasn't getting the response that she needed out of the horse. Um, So she was, Mike was referred to us. Um, (laughs) Mike came out and kind of did, you know, an examination. And from then, you know, within you know, a few shoeings and stuff. She saw a big difference. She saw that he was doing what needed to be done. And the other farrier was, uh, um, just basically, uh, like Mike says, beer money, you know, he was just sure, pulling sure. them off and putting them on type deal. So sure. we, but we've been stuck with him ever since. And then, uh, Mike found out I, I do, there's a couple of, you can see on the back wall, there's a couple other different podcasts that I do. Sure. Uh, and, um, He's like, you know, I, I'd like to give this, this game a shot. I said, okay, you know, let's let's go up here and see how it is. And sure. believe me, I would not do a show if I didn't have all my heart into it. And I I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of doing the show just because, like like I said, you know, the, the education portion of it. I like learning. Yeah. <laughs> and Mike likes learning too. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we're 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 getting through to some horse owners and getting them to think a little bit. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up, um, Travis. When you were talking about educating owners and stuff, that's essentially we we don't care about the farriers because farriers, you know, I well, mean, we do. I mean, but, we do, but yeah, but, no, I, I understand. But yeah. it's the it's the the owners and the trainers and all that stuff that need to have the education uh, outside that the farriers need to you know of course educate themselves on their level. But you know, you sure. need you make sure that your owners are asking. You know the best from their farriers or from the people who take care of the horses. Sure, I think that's a great way to go go about it. And just like we were talking about laminitis, man, if I the incidence rate has markedly lowered, and it's purely from a horse owner education standpoint, right. which is awesome because that's a difficult one to deal with personally and professionally. I've right. I've known my wife for 15 years, and I knew nothing. I've heard the term laminitis. Many times I don't know what it is, and then I don't tell you never do. Yeah, (laughs) and then we started the show, and that's one of our first shows. We were talking about laminitis. I'm like going, okay, what is it? You know, and Mike, you know, he's he's probably said it a million times, but these are fresh years. He's like, oh god, well it's this and it's this. this." I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, okay, now I'm excited. Well, Travis, Travis was in class with me last summer up at Doc Redden's, and uh, you know. He, I know that he does a lot every year to to help educate himself constantly. You got to constantly be. Oh, pushing. you have to. Yeah. Welcome okay. back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. Don't forget for every podcast we do, we have a matching video as well, and you can see this video in real time as we're talking about it here on the air. Uh, you can see us here in the studio, me waving to Mike, Mike waving to me. Hi, Mike. Hey. Go over to YouTube, search Equine Dynamics, Mike Stein. Make sure you subscribe over there. We got a whole bunch of little snippets, little one minute segments of some of the best portions of the podcast. So feel free to go over there and like and share it with all your friends. And joining us here in the studio, Professor Travis Burns from the Virginia Tech a Large Animal Clinic. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Doing great. Now, you've seen, now your career has expanded or expanded over 20 some odd years professionally and, you know, just starting out as a kid. Now, you said 18 years old in 2002. Did I catch that right? Did I catch that math right? So I'm doing, yes. I'm doing the math. I'm like, well, Mike, he's, he's a young guy. He's younger than me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> look where look where I ended up on this show, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. No, but over over your whole entire career, is there any one horse or several horses or any kind of uh certain situations that have stuck out that that's made an impact and set that just kind of affected you on the way you you treat horses now or just in general have uh, just stuck with you, man, you know, I'll never forget that type story. Sure, sure. So, so obviously, one of the things that I'm most interested in from a from a research standpoint and clinical case standpoint are horses that suffer from keratomas or a benign tumor of the keratin producing cells within the the hoof capsule. So, trying to figure out where where they originate, what their etiology is, how they how they occur, why they occur, um, and then along with the treatment part of them, it they tend to be surgically resected. So, big large portions of the hoof wall are removed to remove that that tumor and then it's kind of a fun challenging thing from a fair standpoint to be able how do you stabilize that hoof capsule how do you keep that horse comfortable while that portion of the wall regenerates and so those are a lot of the memorable cases that that I've had that's probably the one I'm the most interested in um, but aside from them the most cases that, that stick with me the longest and I think take the the most toll on you uh, personally would be those laminitis cases so horses suffering with you know again the attachment between the bony column and the the hoof capsule and the ones the success cases I hate to say it but I don't always remember them like it's it's nice it feels good in the in the in that time and and obviously that's the reason we go into this job is to be able to help horses um, but what really sticks with you and what takes a toll on you as a as a profession professional in a job like mine are those cases that don't make it so you know obviously a lot of those cases have already been seen by one or two vet farrier teams before they ever even get here and then they get here and the prognosis obviously goes down and is quite quite guarded sometimes in those severe cases and the ones that you try to to work with for long periods of times it can be several months to to years working with those horses and then uh you know giving all your effort you know reaching out to all your colleagues, getting lots of information, trying everything you can, and ultimately they're humanely destroyed or euthanized, you know, that becomes quite, quite difficult over time. So those, those,
those cases are probably the ones that I remember the most. Like I can remember the horse's name, what they looked like, yeah. the owners, how they felt, the tears at the end. Those are those are hard. Right. Sure. So the question that I have again is, or another question that I have for you is, do you have horses there, Professor? <laughs> um, sure. So actually, we still have my childhood horse. Oh, do you I really? Okay. Horse that I've had. You know, he came to the riding program that my family ran when we were 10 or when I was 10 or 11 years, years old. His name's Roach. And so he's, Roach. he's in his, <laughs> yeah, so he's in his thirties now. Um, he lives out in a, out in a field with my wife has two horses that she competes in shows. And so he's out with them, but he's this old gelding that my kids love to go out and pet and feed and lead around. And so, so now, he's the one I have a special relationship with. The other two are, are there to do a job. Now your wife competes. What, what style of riding does she compete in? Um, she does dressage and eventing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so your plate's full. <laughs> now, do it you go is. to the, now do you go to the shows or do you just let her go off and do her own thing? Cause I don't go to the shows. I don't go to the uh, training events. I don't do any of that stuff. And, but yeah. you know, that's just me. It's, it's paint dry sure. to me. Sure. So, so I'll go to, to some of them. And, and like I mentioned earlier, we have a, a toddler. So we have uh, a daughter, Maddie, who's, who will be four later this month. Oh, congratulations. Um, and she, she likes to go and watch mommy. And then we actually have um, another daughter that was just born about a month ago, Margo on November 15th. And so hopefully she'll get the, the horse bug too. So I can see myself being the little horse show dad before too long. I was so going to It's happening. Back. You got no choice. Yeah. I know. I'm still trying for the four wheelers, but, yeah. but it's, it'd be hard to, to skip the horses. I'm sure. Are so. you sure you don't want to push the, the kids away from them? No, you don't want to do this. No. This is no. too, can we just do no. something simple? Like, like you said, yeah. four wheelers or go-karts yeah. or can we do I'm, something? I'm trying hard. I'm trying. Oh, I feel... Maddie, Maddie's already got two of them. So. Oh, I feel sorry for you, but. But I, you so know worthy. what? It's all good. It's all fun. It brings a family together and yeah. uh, a family that rides together, you know, does everything together type deal. Sure. Uh, so for our listeners, is there any way or can you give out your information just in case our listeners have any questions or anything? How can they get in contact for you to you and how can they find you? Sure. So so probably the easiest way to, to find me would be you could just go to the uh, Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine's website or Google uh, Vet School at Virginia Tech. Um, that's probably the easiest way, but um, absolutely any questions I could answer. My email address is B as in boy, then Travis at VT, like Virginia Tech, dot edu. Uh, but yeah, I'll be happy to help in any way I can. Well, we appreciate you uh, for joining us this week on Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. you have any questions for No, for no, I would, uh, I would like to, when I'm kind of heading on one of my up north runs, come visit you one day hang out see what you're oh, what yeah. you guys are doing up there might pick no, your brain some yeah can, can i no, stay in one than, can i well. can i stay in one of the dorm rooms and be like my college days and run around with a keg on my hand or keg stands and all uh, that maybe, stuff yeah no like the the whole frat row is just one little pond away from us yeah so if you can get around it you can be over there be like that movie old school sure a great time mike anything else you want to add before we let uh professor travis burns yeah, go it was always like always travis it's a treat it's we've gotten mm -hmm. to know each other over the years and yeah always at further ned deals are you going to the summit this year or are you going to uh no i don't think i'll go to the the summit that's it's coming up soon right? it's coming up then oh, january we'll just, third week yeah. of january I'll, i will be there yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, oh. deal with the, the newborn around. I'm not sure. How right. Yeah. Yeah. You got your kind of brain. got your hands full. Well, yeah. we'd like we'd like to thank Professor Travis Burns from Virginia Tech's Large Animal Clinic for joining us this week on Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. On behalf of Mike Stein over there, have a good day. Enjoy your ponies. We'd like to thank Travis Burns for joining us. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. My name is Travis. Saying, see you next week. All of the doggies it wasn't that bad, was it? No, 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 that's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot different than some of the other podcasts I've. Hope I've so. On. Why? What? I've been on some that are like very like, I, I don't know, like almost too regimented. Like every farrier, every person gets asked the exact same questions. Right. And some of them are a little funny. Like, what type of rasp do you like to use? <laughs> What's your favorite? We don't hammer. care. See, that's what I was yeah. telling. That's we what I was care. telling you before. You know, these yeah. other podcasts are like, uh, you know, how long you've been a farrier? Oh, about twenty-two yeah. well, years. How you long been doing well, farrier? <laughs> part yeah, part no, of the thing to get the horse owners to come back, it's got to be a certain <clears throat> certain level of entertainment. Oh, sure. And uh, because you, I did some stuff with uh, the ag department with NC State for a long time, and part yeah. of it, we did these surveys, and everybody, nobody put out. We don't want education. If it was purely education, they wouldn't show up. Oh, exactly. No, you got to have. 
have some fun in there too. Mm-hmm. So I, I know you got to go. I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, edit the audio portion. Uh, okay. and it'll, it'll be posted on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and all that stuff. I'll send you the link once it posts. Uh, I'll okay. also, uh, it takes a little bit longer to render the video down and edit all the video, and I'll send you that link as well. Uh, so, sure. like around supper time tonight or dinner time, whatever you guys yeah. call it up here in North Carolina, <laughs> whatever yeah. Yeah. late night eating time, uh, you'll have an email in your in your box there. So, feel free oh, to. Wow, you do it that quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, Feel free to, to share it, uh, send it off, do whatever you need to do. If, if you know, if you want to post it on your Facebook page, hey, look at me, I'm famous, you know that type. Of yeah. Thing. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah. well, we appreciate you very much, and uh, yeah. we'll let you get back to enjoying your day. Okay. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Have a good one. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.